Greetings. Greetings, and welcome to another day of story time with Dr. Helen Tinsley. How is everyone today on this marvelous Monday? I'm having trouble with my computer today. I was having trouble logging on live, so hopefully um, this will come through all right. I see the screen keeps jumping on my end, so hopefully you don't see it that way on your end. Any rate, welcome to another day of story time. Happy to be here with you today. Let's begin with the, my little song. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. In the stories that I read every day. Greetings. Greetings, Stephanie. Text me and let me know if the screen is jumping on your end because I'm having a hard time uh, seeing it. Hi, Sam. Does it look normal to you guys? Because on my end, the screen is jumping. So text, let me know. At any rate, well, I hope it's okay. So the story I'm gonna to read to you today is about a really significant event in history that uh, people sort of have forgotten about. Yes, it's jumping or yes, it's okay. Hmm? Waiting here. Waiting here, waiting here, waiting here. Is it okay or jumping? Okay, thank you, Sam. So at any rate, the book I'm gonna to read to you today is that about an event that happened 25 years ago, but it was very significant and it's called the Million Man March. Thank you, um, Catherine, Stephanie and Sam. And this book is called One in a Million, My Story of the Million Man March. And it's written by Larry Grant. It's actually autographed to my son. Happy Kwanzaa 97, Hassan. Keep history and hope alive for you to remember the Million Man March. I love when you look back and see an autograph or a uh, insignia to a book. My family, the Morris family was watching television when the news news person announced that Nation of Islam leader, Minister Louis D. Farrakhan asked African-American men to meet in Washington, D.C. The Million Man March would take place on October 16, 1995. The announcement of the Million Man March caused lots of excitement in our house. My sister Sharice asked my father, Ernest, are you and Huey going to the Million Man March? Looking at me, dad answered, definitely. Huey and I are going to Washington DC for the Million Man March. I couldn't hold back my excitement. I was going to the Million Man March. At school the next day, I asked Mr. Jeffries, my history teacher, if he was going to Washington, D.C. for the Million Man March. Huey, I'm definitely going to Washington, D.C. for the Million Man March. October 16th is sure to become an important date in history. Walking home from school, I continued to talk about the Million Man March with Skip and Marion, my best friends. That evening at dinner, all we talked about was the Million Man March. Huey, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, Dad said. Sounding a bit angry, Sharice asked, how come women are not involved in the march?
Women have always been involved in the struggle for freedom. Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, Shirley Chisholm, Queen Mother Moore, and many others. My mother Raina replied, you're right, Sharice. However, what you may not know is that women are involved in the planning of the march at every level. Mr. Muriel called to tell dad about a million man march meeting at the Nat Turner Community Center. Mom called members of her organization, the Nzinga Society, to talk about how they could be involved in the march. They decided to pay for a bus to take some of those men to Washington, D.C. for the march who couldn't afford to go on their own. Men from all over the city gathered to discuss the Million Man March. Oops. That Sunday before the march, Reverend Davis asked all of the men in our church to go to Washington, D.C. for the Million Man March. After church, Dad and I sat on the front porch and talked about the freedom movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Howie, Huey, freedom isn't free. The freedom we have today was paid for by the lives of many, including Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Megha Evers. Mom, Sharice, Aunt Michelle, Aunt Mary, and Grandma Esther were in the kitchen cooking food for the march. Huey, tomorrow's going to be a great day. Get a good night's sleep. My alarm went off at 5 a.m. The day of the Million Man March was finally here. I jumped out of bed, took a shower, and put on the clothes I picked out to wear to the march. Throughout our neighborhood, women gave us hugs, kisses, and words of support. My father and I walked to the Nat Turner Community Center where we greeted our fellow marchers. One by one, each bus left the community center. On the way to the march, we talked about the 1963 March on Washington and sang songs like What's Going On, People Get Ready, and Get Involved. We talked and sang so much that over two hours had gone by before I took a look out the bus window. I could not believe my eyes. In every direction I looked, all I saw were African-American men. When dad and I got off our bus, we were immediately swallowed up by the crowd.
There were men from every part of the country, New York, Dallas, Philadelphia, Chicago, Oakland, Atlanta, Detroit, Houston, and Los Angeles. I was truly one in a million. My father walked right into one of his old college friends. They gave each other a great big bear hug. Huey, this is Dr. Donald Carr. As we walked, Dad and Dr. Carr talked about their families, jobs, and reasons for coming to the march. Archbishop George A. Stallings led us in prayer. Speakers at the march talked about love, respect, honor, unity, responsibility, and commitment. Minister Farrakhan gave us his message. He told us that we were standing on the blood of our ancestors. He said that we had to fix the things we had done wrong in the past. Also, Minister Farrakhan said that African-American men must turn our pain into power and accept the responsibility that God has given us. Then Minister Farrakhan asked us to turn to your brother and hug your brother and tell your brother you love him and let's carry this love all the way back to our cities and towns and never let it die, brothers, never let it die. My father and Dr. Carr hugged one last time. They told each other goodbye and both promised to stay in touch. Then dad and I walked back to the bus. During the ride home, everyone talked about making our community a better place to live. When the buses returned to our neighborhood, the women ran out to meet us. They were very proud of what we had done in Washington, D.C. Wow, getting a little emotional. <laughs> My father and I finally spotted mom and Sharice in the crowd. They gave us great big hugs. Before leaving for home, everyone raised a clenched fist in the air and shouted, long live the spirit of the Million Man March. When we returned home, dad and I sat down with mom and Sharice and told them everything about the Million Man March. It was after midnight when we decided to go to bed. My father and I hugged each other. Huey, today was just the beginning. You must get involved in something that will help others in our community. Stretched across my bed, I continued to think about the Million Man March and what I would do to help others. Skip, Marion, and I started a group called Black Roots. We help younger children in our community read books. You are not too young, get involved. And that, my dear friends, is the end. Um, and this book, at the time, 5% of the proceeds uh, were donated to different organizations 
to support black children, uh, the National Black Child Development Institute, the Children's D Defense Fund, and A Better Chance. So this is the story, one in a million, the story, my story, the Million Man March. I just wanna say that was a very significant time in our history. And my family also went to the Million Man March. Um, my two uh, older sons went with their father and I was one of the women at home cheering them on, proud to see 1 million, they actually said it was about 2 million, black men come together in unity. Now let's fast forward to 2020. We are facing a national pandemic. So to the children and the adults that may be listening, it's time for us to unify. Black people are dying more than anyone else from this virus. So it's time not just for black people to unify, but for people of goodwill and, and people who care about humanity and their fellow brother and sister to unify for what's good. So in this right now, the unification that we need is to practice uh, safety precautions. Stay in your home if you can. If you go out, go out only when it's absolutely necessary. If you have to go to work, use all the precautions, wear your mask, put your gloves on. When you discard your gloves, put them in the garbage. Do not drop them on the ground. Do not drop your use mask on the ground. Practice safe cautions and be caring. We need to be unified. We need to be organized. We need to be kind to one another. We need to be patient with, with, with one another and we need to be mindful to each other. And so hopefully that book, One in a Million, will share, will make people think of some of the uh, lessons that we should have all learned from the Million Man March. That hopefully people will learn now from this pandemic because really all we have is our belief in a higher power and one another. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed the stories for today and be well, and I will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Oh, first, hi, Darcel. Hi, Aunt Carol. Well, I didn't think I was preaching, but I was sharing. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Sam. Hi, Catherine. And uh, to anyone else watching or uh, that joined me live, hello to you as well, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Peace.